This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. All right, this final presentation of COAC 2023. Uh, it's the only one on counterfeit coins, which is really, really interesting to me. And uh, also uh, kind of gives a, a, beh a behind the scenes look at something that we probably shouldn't have seen because the only the way that we know about this information is because they got caught, essentially. Uh, Bill Dalzell is an ANS associate member um, and the managing numismatist of the cataloging staff of Classical Numismatic Group in, uh, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, where he specializes, specializes in cataloging ancient world and British coinage for the fixed price lists and auctions. Uh, his research areas include the ancient Roman led tesserae, uh, the coinage of Liberia, and the mint and brass rolling concerns of Belleville, New Jersey. There, those are three of the most random <laughs> things that don't fit together, but he does it uh, wonderfully. Um, Bill grew up in Belleville and still visits frequently, so he does have firsthand account knowledge of, of this location. Today, Bill is going to give us the only presentation, again, that deals specifically with counterfeit coins, giving a slightly different perspective into design and production in, quote, United States versus Gardner, Copper, Counterfeiting, and Connections in Belleville, New Jersey. Please welcome Bill Dalzell. Uh, I'd just like to start out by thanking again all of our sponsors, uh, the ANS and um, librarians and archivists across the country and across the world who uh, couldn't have done this without them. So the, in the early 1830s, um, the town of Belleville, New Jersey was a budding center of the Industrial Revolution in the United States. Located on the west bank of the Passaic River, just north of the city of Newark, industry first came to Belleville as a result of its proximity to Arndt Schuyler's Arlington Copper Mine, just across the river. Um, Early industrial developments focused around the steam engines required to pump water from the flooded and difficult mines. In particular, uh, Josiah Hornblower uh, established the Soho Manufactory uh, in Belleville that was in fact named for Bolton and Watts, much more famous Soho Manufactory in Birmingham. Um, and as a, result, as a result of that, Mint did establish itself in Belleville. So in some ways, there was a little Soho Mint that was established in the US, but completely unofficially. Um, in 1816, English, Englishman Thomas Uffington purchased a disused powder mill along Belleville's Second River to house his gold beating business. This enterprise soon expanded in the, into the production of sheet brass, among other ancillary goods. Uh, we can see uh, Belleville is down here, just north of Nork, and a bit west of us. Uh, Joseph, uh, excuse me, uh, in 1829, Uffington declared bankruptcy. The rolling mills in the Glenridge section of neighboring Bloomfield were acquired by Uffington's apprentice, James G. Moffat, the same Moffat responsible for hard times tokens for his New York City location. The mills in Belleville went to William Stevens, and the brass rolling arm in particular reconstituted as Stevens, Thomas, and Fuller. It is under these auspices that the many coins and tokens attributed to Belleville were struck. Joseph Gardner is claimed to have apprenticed uh, with A. Wyan in Birmingham, um, but I have not been able to find any further information about this or demonstrate it. Uh, Joseph Gardner's name first appears in relation to Stevens, Thomas, and Fuller and Belleville in general with the dissolution in June 1832 of a button manufacturing concern in which he partnered with Arthur Nichols, John Gibbs, and James Bishop. John Gibbs would continue with Gardner and Buttons for a little less than a year and would apparently retain, or remain involved with Stevens, Thomas, and Fuller for some time after that. James Bishop, however, appears to be the one responsible for drawing legal scrutiny to Belleville's coining endeavors. Trouble began on the 30th of March, 1835, when one Francois Cali was arrested with a large quantity of Haitian coins. A search was effected of the Brig Caroline, where authorities found six dies, a, quote, power press, cutting and milling machines. Mr. Calise apparently intended to travel to St. Thomas to set up his counterfeiting operation. The police investigation led authorities to one John Lewis, a mixed race Haitian arrested less than a month later, who was responsible for connecting Calise with James Bishop. 
Articles note that through these intermediaries, Bishop contracted with one Elaine Lontad of Port-au-Prince to produce 12,000 Haitian dollars and half dollars in copper, spelter, silver, and nickel at a rate of 18 cents to the dollar, 10 cents to the half dollar. Bishop, along with his partner, Henry Havel, would be arrested in May 1835 in New York City on charges of counterfeiting pistarines. Bishop's lawyer would argue that as the pieces were manufactured in New Jersey, the case was outside of that court's jurisdiction, and also that pistarines were not current coin of the United States and thus not a felony to counterfeit. The same day that this story ran in the New York Evening Post, across the river New Jersey, the Nork Daily Advertiser related that foreign coins were being manufactured in Bloomfield, of which, then, of which Belleville was then a part. Clearly, official eyes had turned towards the New Jersey establishment. On the 2nd of June, 1835, the shoe dropped. Joseph Gardner was arrested at his home in Belleville, New Jersey, on charges of counterfeiting. Information from the, about this case comes down to us from some of the same newspapers that related Bishop's legal troubles, offering the same limited perspective and summarized information. Yet for all their similarities, the case of United States v. Gardner differs in a few significant aspects. For one, this case went much further, landing in the US Supreme Court. And importantly, Gardner was backed by the money and connections of his associates, the brass rolling firm of Stevens, Thomas and Fuller, who secured for him the best legal representation by Samuel Southard, former governor of New Jersey, and then sitting United States Senator. In an amazing archival boon, uh, Southard's papers survive and today are preserved at Princeton. Uh, the file for this case can be broken down into several distinct sections. Several pages written in a different hand from the rest provide the testimony of Gardner himself. This is followed by extensive, though heavily abbreviated notes by Southard from the trial. There are also many pages of legal research used to argue the case, as well as various documents and receipts. Together, these notes provide an unparalleled look into the operations of a 19th century engraver, the structure and relationships of a professional coining establishment, and the complex question of counterfeiting in the early republic. The sworn testimony of Joseph Gardner provides the clearest first-hand description of events that are available to us, though it obviously differs in details and motivation from what the prosecution relates. He begins with the description of his house. Gardner lived in Belleville with his wife Anne and their children, about five yards off the road and 200 from the factory of Stevens, Thomas, and Fuller. I've uh, illustrated it on the, this 1872 map. Uh, he lived in a good-sized uh, but slightly run-down house uh, with two floors of five rooms each and a basement. The east-facing dwelling served both as home and workshop for Gardner. The family lived on the second floor with the first floor used for light work and heavier machine work in the basement. Friends and associates were free to come and go as they pleased, usually entering through the back garden, and the doors were apparently never locked. Um, this is, uh, I believe, the location of uh, the mills of Stevens, Thomas, and Fuller. Uh, they were later uh, purchased by the DeWitt Wire Cloth Company, um, and it's, uh, that is the wire factory marked here in this 1872 map. At about 12.30 on the 2nd of June, 1835, two men arriving by carriage came to the front door calling for Joseph Gardner. Mrs. Gardner, thinking her husband was in the workshops, went to fetch him. Not finding him there, she met the man on the back stoop and invited them to wait, as he was not far off. They declined, claiming they would return in half an hour. When asked their names and business, they told Anne that a Mr. Keene of Nork wanted to see him and that they were interested in purchasing the house. One of the men who remained in the carriage she recognized as Sheriff Robinson. The men then departed in the direction of Stevens, Thomas, and Fuller. Not five minutes later, Joseph Gardner returned. He immediately realized that something strange was afoot and that the proposal to purchase the house was a deception. At this point, Anne began to panic. She knew her husband was in trouble for cutting dyes, which she had dreaded since Bishop's legal problems began. But her husband insisted to her that he had done nothing wrong. Quote, she began to be very unhappy, and so did I, which is a succinct way to put it. Anne begged him to hide the dyes, though he protested Joseph and Anne hid some of the dyes in the barn and elsewhere to alleviate his wife's fears. 
The couple then waited on the back stoop for about 45 minutes before they saw the marshal coming through the backwoods. Joseph told his wife that something must be wrong and suggested that she go inside. Quote, she was very much frightened. I told her not to be afraid. I had done nothing they could hurt me for. I then turned round and went to meet the marshal. The marshal confirmed Gardner's identity and placed him under arrest. The next interaction is of particular note. Quote, he arrested me as a coiner. I told him I was not a coiner. I was a die maker and metal maker. And I could not think the origin of this belief. It was me being employed at the factory. If anything wrong had been done, it was not for me, for I was ignorant of anything wrong. The authorities then searched the premises. Gardner claims, again, that nothing was locked and the marshal was free to search everything. A number of French and Spanish American coins were seized, all of which were claimed to be authentic, as well as a parcel of gold dust. In the garden and in the barn were found a bag of Haitian coins, Haitian dyes, and dyes for French five francs and Spanish pistarines. They then brought over Gardner's employee and assistant, Joseph Campbell. He was shown the dyes and asked if he had helped Gardner use them, but he claimed he had not. Gardner's testimony then claims that Campbell was offered to be well paid should he turn state's witness and testify against Gardner. Campbell and Gardner were both then taken to the jail in Nork. The engraver's bail was set at $4,000. and alone was unable and alone was unable to come up with the money, but the funds were provided by Gardner's friend Thomas, who is presumably Thomas Thomas of the Belleville firm. Talk about difficult to search names. The prosecution's witnesses paint a less rosy picture. According to General Darcy, the US Marshal responsible, the conversation between Gardner, Campbell, and Darcy was more hostile. Gardner apparently claimed in a rather menacing tone that he was in pursuit of lawful business in which laws would protect him. Darcy pointed out that the dyes found were for coins that were considered current in the US, and that if they were to find dyes of US coins, it would be a more serious matter, a statement to which Gardner agreed. In addition to Darcy, the other men present during the search were each called to testify, including Sheriff Robinson, Deputy David Ball, James Keene, and David Jones. Southard's notes on their testimonies allow us to glean some further information. The men are clearly dealing with material with which they are not particularly familiar. Casting and striking of the same coins or metals is mentioned in the same line, equipment is confusingly described, and the dyes and coins themselves are misidentified. At one point, Darcy refers to a French five franc and a pistarine die, but cautions that he is not familiar with these coins and has difficulties viewing the designs in reverse. The men described some further details of the house. The basement featured a small bellows, forge, and crucibles with lathes and other tools in a different room. As described by Gardner, the heavy work was primarily done there. Various metals or coins were retrieved from cabinets and tables on the first floor, which seems to have primarily functioned as a shop, but those of the lathe shop, oh, excuse me, um, with a room there for lighter work uh, on the first floor with the tables and, and cases. Um, the windows in the front rooms were all fitted with curtains, but those of the lathe shop were not. The prosecution's main witness was Joseph Campbell, Gardner's assistant, who had arrived in Belleville from Philadelphia in August 1834. It is difficult to consider his an unbiased testimony. Several of his claims seem to not match reality that Stevens, Thomas, and Fuller moved their factory from New York, or that Gardner was striking items in gold. Significantly, Campbell is also the source of the two pistarines that the engraver was accused of striking. Nevertheless, Campbell does provide insight into the day-to-day -day operation. Casting, though in this instance, I believe he him to mean striking, um, lathing, cutting out, and other prep was carried on in the basement, with engraving work upstairs. The windows and doors, mostly with broken glass, were always open when this work was carried out, but were closed at night. Um, Campbell also notes that he saw Washington medals and helped strike these on a press, which was apparently done at night. Regarding the Washington medals, Sheriff Robinson in describing Garner's main workshop, quote, saw a medal then said to be with head of wash. John Campbell in describing what he saw working as Gardner's assistant, quote, saw medals for wash for cast. This night, four weeks, helped to strike them with a press. G told me to say I knew nothing but I knew nothing made there but metals. The metal in question has not been identified. 
Gardner is known to have engraved the Ugly Head Medal, uh, but that is generally dated to 1862 and believed to have been struck in Waterbury, Waterbury Connecticut. Show the slide of that. Um, either this medal was initially struck in Belleville in 1835, the dies then brought to the Scovilles and re retained there to have been struck again in 1862, or there is another Washington medal yet to be attributed to Gardner. Um, according to Campbell, the pistorines were first made over the course of four weeks in April. The medal was rolled at Stevens, Thomas, and Fuller and sometimes cut there, sometimes at Gardner's. The coins themselves, however, were made at Gardner's. Campbell snuck one pistorine directly from the press and through the course of striking, secreted away a few more in his watch pocket. He took that one to an individual in Nork who told him it was a counterfeit pistorine and to return it to whomever he got it from. Interestingly, Throughout all of this, the relationship between Campbell or between Gardner and Campbell appears to have remained a positive one. Deputy Ball claims that Gardner was very sympathetic toward Campbell and sincerely sorry that he was involved. Likewise, Campbell consistently spoke highly of Gardner. However, Ball also notes that Campbell was, quote, not afraid of Mr. Gardner, but of his associates. Uh, Southard's notes on Darcy's testimony also include a more detailed list of the items seized. Uh, it's up on the uh, screen there, uh, a gold or bullion, coins in a paper bundle found in a drawer, a bag of Haitian coins, a box of dyes, a die for a Spanish dollar dated 1815, an unfinished die of an uncertain type. Um, one of the uh, pros uh, prosecution's witnesses apparently said they thought it was that of a doubloon. Uh, two Spanish dollar dies, presumably the reefers is associated uh, with the other two. Uh, die for a Spanish dollar dated 1816. Die for a Haitian coin with a bust of President J.P. Boyer. A die for a Haitian coin, presumably with the reverse of the Boyer obverse. Uh, a box of various medals and various coins, all of which were types that were familiar to the marshal. The gold, according to Gardner, was re remained for when he was engaged in the button business and had been brought by him from Europe. It was intended for use in gilding, a technique with which Gardner was apparently quite skilled, as it was for this that he was initially sought out by the Scovilles later on. The gold was deposited by Southard with the U.S. Mint in December 1835 and given a value of $995.20. Campbell, however, claimed that he was sent to Mansion House in Belleville to retrieve the parcel of gold. Uh, Mansion House was a, uh, an inn at the time in the town. Um, uh, or at the very least, he retrieved a similar, similar parcel from William Stevens of Stevens, Thomas, and Fuller. As the gold was in flake or dust form, there is little chance that it was intended to be used for coining. As an aside, Mansion House was at this point operated by Tobias Seaman, for whom a likely satirical token was struck a few years later. Uh, the various uh, coins listed back. The various coins listed as uh, items 2 and 12 uh, are all identified in the course of the trial as official coins of good metal um, rather than counterfeits. Among these were various Mexican and Spanish American issue, silver issues and a few French five francs. Um, the latter in particular were under suspicion by the authorities. Uh, likewise, the majority of the other dies appear to be completely innocuous, the normal working stock of an engraver. Uh, Darcy testified that many dies were found, including for Haitian and South American coins, as well as for medals and most likely tokens. Dies for five francs and pistorines were among these, um, though he didn't uh, specifically note them in his other lists. The Spanish dollar dies of 1815 and 1816 are referred to elsewhere in the document as being Mexican, um, but it's certainly possible that this is a misstatement. Um, Gurney, in his study of contemporary counterfeit eight reals, records three varieties of 1815 dated Mexican counterfeits and 12 of 1816, um, but to my eye, none of them appear to have been made with punches similar to those attributed to Belville. Doesn't mean that they weren't, I just I can't demonstrate anything there. Um, the Haitian coins and dies are of particular interest. The notes later indicate that these were struck in copper about the size of a contemporary scent and carried a, picture, a portrait of J.P. Boyer. The Haitian series overall has not yet been the subject of a detailed die or variety study, but the earlier counterfeits are, are generally well known. As the coins in question here depict Boyer, uh, the palm tree counterfeits can be eliminated, as can any of the often crude copper one and two centime issues. The scent size indicates that the coin in question must be a 100 centime, 
also referred to in Haiti as a gour. Uh, two groups of counterfeits can be identified as candidates. First and most dramatically are the various 100 centimes overstruck on US cents, um, including the illustrated example here uh, that is in the ANS collection. You can see uh, the head of liberty peeking out from behind Boyer's bust, and uh, it's actually oriented, so the undertype of the, the large scent is, uh, is uh, horizontal here. Um, there are also very common silver washed or plated examples of the year 27 issue uh, that often passes official in the numismatic market today. Campbell was apparently directed by Gardner to tell the grand jury that the Haitian coins were made at the factory of Stevens, Thomas, and Fuller. Thomas later testifies that their Haitian coins were, quote, made of half silver and half copper, and that Gardner was employed by the firm to make the dyes. He was not aware of Gardner striking any of his own. The exact relationship of these counterfeits to Bishop, Gardner, and the Belleville Mint, or indeed even to the official Hotel de Monet in Port-au-Prince, remains unclear. The overstruck U.S. cent in the ANS appears to share dyes with 100 centimes that in all other aspects appear to be official full silver issues. Given that Belleville is quite open about producing these coins, it is possible that they were operating that they were operating with some official sanction from the Haitian government. Um, I, this doesn't seem very likely. Uh, a June, uh, 5 June 1833 circular published by President Boyer warrants of counterfeit 150 centime coins entering circulation with yellow copper pieces appearing in Saint-Domingue and red copper ones in Lacay. In all likelihood, one of these groups consisted of the coins produced by Stevens, Thomas, and Fuller. Um, I do hope to undertake a more comprehensive die study of the Haitian series that will hopefully identify this issue. The Pistorines themselves, uh, the actual source of Gardner's legal problems, were not found on the premises, and the only pieces known to the prosecution were those provided by Campbell. These were peninsular Spanish pieces, the Real de Velon, struck in Madrid, one issue of Carlos IV, two of Ferdinand VII, dated 1794 MMF, 1823 MAJ, and 1824 MAJ, respectively. These are charmingly illustrated by Southard himself. Um, no examples of these coins have been traced today, although they, there are other contemporary counterfeits known for the series, particularly with the 1833 date. Southard's notes from his own witnesses are understandably brief. All were wealthy and successful Belleville individuals. Nicholas Andraliman, Caleb Nagels, John C. Lloyd, and Thomas Thomas. They served predominantly as character witnesses for Gardner and against Campbell. Duraliman claims that Campbell, quote, does not stand any fair for truth and veracity and was not a man of truth. Nagels and Lloyd both testify that Gardner was a fine, upstanding member of the community, but have nothing positive to say of Campbell. The testimony of Thomas Thomas is perhaps the most numismatically significant section of Southard's notes. According to him, Gardner had been in Belleville for about four years, having come from England, and was initially concerned in the button business with John Gibbs and James Bishop, as we have seen earlier. Thomas credits Gardner with creating dyes for the Brazilian, Haitian, and Liberian coinages. Discussing the Haitian issues, he notes that Gardner ceased to be a partner after about a year. This line is crucial in demonstrating the engraver's relationship to the factory. Rather than being on the payroll, he was seemingly contracted to produce particular dyes, and a portion of his pay payment was received as a share of profits over a period of time. Thomas also indicates that a similar agreement existed for Gardner in relation to sheet brass buttons, uh, confirming that this business was in fact taken over by Stevens, Thomas, and Fuller at some point. The Brazilian coinage, he testifies, was made of pure copper. He does not, however, say what, would, what it would pass for and declines to state for whom it was made, citing the risk to those transporting the coins to Brazil. With regards to the Pistorines, he claims to have no knowledge and had only seen those made by Bishop. Thomas confirms that the Pistorine and five franc dies recovered could have been used to strike their respective coins, but he further notes that die sinkers frequently had other dies than those they used, both for current coin and other pieces. Um, Neil, it might interest you to know that he claims that Wright and Bale had made their own dies for Spanish milled dollars and pistarines alike. <laughs> There's little threads from this that kind of seep throughout all of our presentations this weekend. 
Um, one last line stands out in Thomas's testimony. Southard writes, quote, um, from Thomas's testimony, quote, Dr. Moore employed us in relation to blank sense. I brought this up in my paper on the Liberian coins, and I did not have a satisfactory answer for it at the time. Um, what precisely Stevens, Thomas, and Fuller did for Mint Director Samuel Moore is not known. The Mint records make no mention of anything that would fit the bill, though this is around the time that Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Mint began to seek American sources for their copper after having relied on Soho and Birmingham for so long. Despite um, in this extensive discussion by the prosecution of both the bag of gold and the Haitian counterfeits, the actual indictments make no mention of these. The initial indictments were for two counts of counterfeiting French five francs, one of federal quarters, and one of, quote, quarters of Spain. On the 15th, 15th of June, 1835, a second indictment was issued for two counts of counterfeiting head pisterines. The gold was found to be a legitimate component of Gardner's business, while the charges relating to the French coins were dropped as those dyes apparently were not hardened and could not have been used to strike coins. Outside of Gardner's own testimony, where he proclaims that he is an engraver and not a coiner, the notes carry little discussion of whether or not the engraver actually made these pistorines. This point may have been put forth uh, by the defense's witnesses uh, and thus not well covered by Southard's notes, or alternately, the defense may have readily accepted that these coins were, were, that these coins were made by Gardner as a way to shield Gardner's other more powerful partners in Belleville. In any case, Southard's legal argument focused on demonstrating that regardless of who made them, the pistorines were not subject to current counterfeiting laws. To set forth this point, Southard calls first on William E. Dubois of the U.S. Mint's assay department. Dubois assays the pistorines in question, finding them a very close assay um, with a silver value of 22, uh, between 22 and a quarter and 22 and a half cents, in line with other pistorines assayed by the Mint at other times. Southard then begins to drive towards his point. Is the head pistorine a part of the Spanish milled dollar? Dubois is to the point. They are believed not to be a part of the Spanish milled dollar. They are not regarded at the mint as a part of the Spanish milled dollar. In addition to the assayer's testimony, Southard draws upon a number of authorities on coinage to demonstrate the role of pistorines in American marketplaces and legal codes. He cites Kelly's Universal Canvas and Commercial Instructor, published London, 1821. Uh, he cites Bonneville's Traite de Monet, d'Or et d'Argent, published in Paris in 1806. Uh, Roger Rudding's Annals of the Coinage of Britain and its Dependencies, published in London, 1817. And uh, Torres's An Exposition of the Commerce of South America, published Philadelphia, 1816. Southard is able to demonstrate to the court that the colonial coins of the Spanish Empire struck in the New World are on the Mexican plate standard, while those of mainland Spain are on the new plate standard. Accordingly, these head pistorines are not part of the Spanish milled dollar as such. With the nature of the coins thus established, it was left to the defense to prove that such coins were not illegal to produce under US law. In 1792, Congress passed the Coinage Act, establishing the system of American coinage in gold, silver, and copper, followed the next year, by an act making foreign coin legal tender and establishing their values while explicitly sorry um, making foreign coin legal tender and establishing their values which explicitly describes the spanish milled dollar and its parts the legal tender of status of foreign coins would shift back and forth over the coming decades as jacksonian medalists battled proponents of the bank of the united states the counterfeiting act of 1806 makes it a felony to create gold and silver coins, quote, which have been or which hereafter shall be coined at the mint of the United States, as well as any, quote, any foreign gold or silver coins, which by law now or hereafter shall be made current or be in actual use and circulation as money within the United States. The pistarines st allegedly struck by Gardner are illegal regardless of their currency at the moment, as the 1806 law covers any coins that circulate in the United States. This was the understanding of the prosecution. However, Southard argued that this was not the current law. The Crimes Act of 1825, a major piece of criminal legislation that overhauled crime and punishment in the country, superseded the 1806 Act. This law makes no mention of coins in actual use and circulation. It speaks only of gold or silver coin which has been or hereafter may be coined at the mint of the United States, 
and of foreign gold or silver coin, which by law is or hereafter may be made current in the United States. With no mention of the coins actually in circulation, only those foreign coins specifically elucidated by the 1793 Act or subsequent legislation are subject to the current anti-counterfeiting law. The jury rendered a special verdict, finding Gardner guilty, but hinging on the precise interpretation of these particular coins in US law. The circuit court judges were opposed in opinion with two questions. Whether, quote, whether the head pistarine, so-called, is a part of a Spanish milled dollar, and whether such pistarine or piece of coin is a silver coin of Spain made current by law in the United States. Their decision was stayed until review by the Supreme Court. In January 1836, Supreme Court Justice Smith Thompson delivered the opinion of the court. Head pistarines were not a part of the Spanish milled dollar and are not coins made current by law in the United States. Following the trial, Gardner appears to have resumed work with Stevens, Thomas, and Fuller. From 1837 or 1838 to 1839, the New York City Directory lists him as residing at 91 William Street, though this does not necessarily indicate that he cut ties with Belleville. In April of 1839, Gardner was approached by J.M.L. Scovel of the Scovel Manufacturing Company in Waterbury, Connecticut. The Scovels were particularly interested in Gardner for his skill in gilding, a process of great importance in the button manufacturing process. Negotiations would continue through May when he was hired to a two-year contract and moved to Connecticut. As we have seen, in compensation for his dye work for Stevens, Thomas, and Fuller, Gardner received a percentage of the profits. His arrangement with the Scovels was slightly different. Gardner was to receive a regular salary for his day-to-day -day work. In his free time, however, he could engrave dyes for metals or metalettes to be struck at the factory for which he would receive a percentage of the profits. It is surely in this capacity that the several small metalettes attributed to Gardner were made, as well as the common uh, Henry Clay Hard Times token. Gardner returned to New Jersey following his stint with the Scovels. In 1840, he opened his own brass manufactory at 32 Mulberry Street in Newark. By 1840, he had taken up residence at 118 Nassau Street in Caldwell. Joseph Gardner died of stomach cancer on the 18th October, 1879. His wife, Anne, passed a few years later on the 27th of March, 1885. Both of them are buried in a family plot in Rosedale Cemetery in Montclair, New Jersey. The legal scrutiny appears to have impacted the coining operations of Stevens, Thomas, and Fuller. Before the trial, the majority of their issues appear to have been counterfeits for export to Brazil, Haiti, Nova Scotia, and more. Though these coinages cannot be dated more precisely, after the trial, no further contemporary references are found, and they appear to have ceased to be struck sometime around 1835. No coins or tokens can be shown to have been struck in Belleville in the year 1836. By 1837, however, the legally problematic counterfeits have been supplanted by domestic and foreign copper tokens. Around this time, the massive issues of hard times tokens and Canadian bouquet were struck with their own accompanying legal issues, subject for another paper. Though the engraver of these issues is generally given in numismatic sources as John Gibbs, uh, this attribution is based on a group of what are likely satirical tokens naming Gibbs. Um, I'd suggested this in my paper on Liberia, and since then I discovered that it was actually proposed originally by Alfred Reed in the 1930s, and I have not seen that discussion earlier. Uh, the timeline of uh, the issues from Belleville would roughly appear to match Gardner's residency in relation to Belleville, um, and in fact Gardner may have left for New York City following the burst of token minting activity in 1837 or 1838. After the late 1830s or early 1840s, coining activities in Belleville ceased, and Stevens, Thomas, and Fuller shifted production to the more profitable and legal rolled brass wire and wire mesh. Gardner's story was forgotten by all but those who lived it. Interest in the mint, Gardner, and Belleville's counterfeiting activities was briefly revived in the 1890s. On the 2nd of June, 1895, the Nork Sunday Call published a brief article purporting to relate the story through a Civil War veteran who recently revisited his old stomping grounds in Belleville. The details of this version appear to be drawn from the same newspaper articles that survive today, though here richly embellished. 
The gentleman claims to have assisted old man Uffington in the counterfeiting activities and that James Moffat and Joseph Gardner engaged in the business. He relates that some individuals across the river in Bergen County began counterfeiting federal quarters and half dollars, but that their servants stole some of the coins and attempted to pass them, ultimately leading the police to arrest, to arrest him at his own house. The man also claims that for years afterward, when a house or factory was pulled down in Belleville, it was no uncommon thing to find counterfeit money which had been hidden away in secret corners. This is clearly a modified version of the arrest of Joseph Gardner and of his wife's stashing of dyes and coins. The details in the 1895 article are not corroborated elsewhere. When numismatist Ly Lyman Lowe sought information on the town and its history for his work on hard times tokens, he corresponded with sev several individuals who had been alive at the time. Lowe's initial contacts were made through William Weeks, a Newark lawyer and ANS member who would soon fall into disgrace for some of his own legal troubles. Uh, Weeks forwarded uh, Lowe's information, for, uh, forwarded Lowe information from uh, the longtime Belleville resident, Judge Theodore Sandford, uh, who was actually the author of Belleville's chapter in Shaw's History of Essex and Hudson Counties, uh, published in 1884. Sandford notes that, quote, I did refer to the counterfeiting of money at Belleville immediately, and to have referred more fully to matters connected here therewith would have cast some shadow upon persons now living in the city of Nork of great intelligence and repute. Lowe also corresponded with Aaron Lloyd, the son of John Lloyd, who actually testified in 1835 on behalf of Gardner, though the son seemed not to be aware of that connection. John Lloyd was a tailor and later on the Justice of the Peace, who had purchased and used buttons both from John Gibbs, Joseph Gardner, as well as from William Stevens. Joseph Gardner is not known as one of the most talented engravers of his day. Indeed, uh, one of the few medals signed by him is generally regarded by numismatists as among the worst of Washington's portraits. That's again the uh, ugly head medal. And even that is often misattributed to a John Gardner. But among his colleagues, Gardner was clearly held in high regard. After all, Thomas and his associates hired for him the finest legal representation. Writing a few years before the engraver's death, Judge Sanford describes him and Gibbs as, quote, mechanics of more than ordinary skill in many branches, notably that of die sinking. Gardner was a working engraver who provided for his family by the skill of his hands. He never achieved a national coinage contract or worked for a major world mint. Rather, he worked out of his own home, periodically contracting his labor out to other firms with larger distribution networks, such as Stevens, Thomas and Fuller or the Scobles. This work led Gardner and the mints who employed him into legal gray areas at the margins of American industry and finance, counterfeiting and somewhat later token manufacture. In this way, I would suggest that Gardner's story is perhaps more typically American than that of uh, someone like a Wyan or a Reich. Um, thank you. And if you have any questions at all, there's a lot I left out on Belleville because there's just so much to talk about. So. And uh, just to go back a, a number of slides, the background is... Uh, derived from Gardner's business card. Too far, too far. At the bottom it notes, uh, medals for schools always on hand. Actually, uh, John Sally has in his collection a silver uh, metal that just very plain metal just says reward for merit with a hand engraved reverse and it actually matches some of the letter punches for Belleville so we we can attribute the uh, the school uh, metal. Uh, any questions? That area is like route 21 now? Yes um, it's actually uh, Twin Towing Company. It's about a block up from Route 21. Any old buildings still around that area? Not no. there. Um, the, the Rose Cottage is the first is the oldest surviving house in Belleville. It's dated to the 1720s. Uh, that survives. It's a couple of blocks further north, though. Um, the location of what I believe would have been Gardner's house is a Dollar Tree. Thank you.
Any other questions or comments? I don't know if we have anything online. They will magically appear on the screen if we do. Yes, Chris McDowell. Lucky you, there's a criminal defense attorney in the crowd. <laughs> uh, I didn't quite understand what have been the probative or ev evidentiary value of the manufacturer of the metal uh, in the trial, how that would tend to make him more guilty uh, of a crime of counterfeiting when it wouldn't have been counterfeiting to make a metal. Um, the, the accusation was for counterfeiting the pistorines. Um, the metals, the Haitian coins, they were all just really evidence that he could strike, he could make coins and, and metals. If, if I understood that correctly, I am not a criminal attorney. Uh, so I, I really tried to focus more on what the, the case notes told us about engraving and about the, the location and his relationship with uh, the other individuals involved. Um, I would I would love for more comments on uh, my interpretation of the, the legal side of things. Well, one Jesse, question online. Yes, how can we uh, access your mentioned paper on Liberia? Uh, it was published in the AJN in 2021. I think there's also a long table, right? And th yes, yes, there is also a, a long table that's more on the, the Belleville Mint in general. I do go over uh, more of the coins and tokens that are attributed to Belleville Mint in that presentation. That is on YouTube. Thank you to the ANS. Jesse, yes, you have, do, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you perfectly fine. Yeah, this is Chuck Heck. I, I seem to have sent the question, but I must have chopped it off. Um, about the American Colonization Society uh, token, uh, Liberia token, it was dated mm -hmm. 1833. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd just like to ask if uh, you've ever come across any evidence that the Belleville Mint was responsible for making those tokens. Yes, um, I talk about it a lot in my paper. Uh, there is, it's a, there's a couple of different pieces of evidence. Number one, Thomas Thomas directly states in his testimony that Gardner was, it, the one who engraved them for Stevens, Thomas, and Fuller. Um, there is a, a token in a private collection that is engraved. Uh, it's the what I call what would call the pattern issue um, from the, the very first set of dies, uh, and engraved on the reverse is Belleville, September 1833. I forget the exact date that's engraved on it. Um, and that's additionally, uh, I have a letter from uh, the purchasing agent of the ACS uh, talking about uh, Belden. That That's incredible. Thank you. That that answers a big question. I, <laughs> I've been searching and I just didn't read your uh, your article. Hopefully I, I'm able to answer all the questions in that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, one more question is his defense did gardner in his defense did gardner ever reveal who commissioned him to produce dyes for foreign coins and why they did so yes um stevens thomas and fuller is very upfront and open that they produced coins for haiti and brazil um they make no attempt to to hide that effort it was public knowledge um they were apparently quite secure at, up, up until then um in their understanding of the law that it would be okay um they are not comfortable sharing who they were sending the coins to in Brazil. Um, a couple of, uh, I believe it's October of that year of 1835, um, uh, Captain David Cox of the, uh, the Charles Denison was the name of the ship, um, uh, chartered out of Belleville, um, was arrested in New York, was arrested in New York with a, uh, with a hold full of counterfeit Brazilian coins. Um, but they had to let him go because there was nothing illegal about counterfeiting uh, Brazilian rice. Reyes, however you pronounce it. Any other final uh, questions, comments, concerns? That might wrap us up for COAC 2023. One more round of applause. Thank you so much. All right, so that wraps it up for everyone. Uh, unless there's any anyone who else wants to present. Uh, no, we're good. All right, all right, sounds good. I have a long list of people I really do need to thank. Uh, first of all, of course, our sponsors, the Resolute Americana Collection and the Stack Family. Uh, ANS President Uta Martenberg, ANS Executive Director Dr. Gilles Brondberg, uh, ANS Deputy Director Dr. Nathan Elkins, uh, ANS Chief Curator Dr. Peter Van Alphen. ANS uh, Director of Development and Outreach, Caitlin Smith, 
uh, membership co coordinator, Liberty Sova, um, museum coordinator, uh, Rebecca Komen Rager, uh, Director of Information Technology, Bennett Hibner. Uh, he and Director of Photography, Alan Roche, have been hiding in the back for most of the presentations. They've been putting all of the production on, so, so thank you very much for them. Um, Art Director, Emma Pratt, she's been uh, uh, moderating Zoom for us. Uh, Mike behind the glass, keep, keeping us safe. Uh, really, all of my ANS colleagues, of course, couldn't have made this happen. Uh, long list of speakers in order Eric Goldstein, Christopher McDowell, Mark Tomasco, Roger Burdett, uh, Robert L. Rodriguez, P. Scott Rubin, Emily Pierce Siegerman, uh, William Nyberg, Leonard Augsburger, Neil Masanti, Scott H. Miller, and Bill Dalzell. Thank you, everyone. Uh, they each put in uh, countless, countless hours. Uh, one wasn't abashed to say 600 hours just of research, uh, and then just hundreds of hours more. Um, of course, Pie Bakery, uh, Trey Sorrell, Sophia's was excellent, uh, Pepolino, we'll see, and of course, all our visitors, viewers, both in person and uh, online. Uh, thank you so much. Another round of applause, please. Thank you.